All right. Uh, everyone, welcome uh, to our uh, work from anywhere with FlexPod and VDI. We're going to be going specifically over uh, a specific uh, CVD that was just released, just one of those timing things. Uh, that was just released, um, and but at the beginning we're going to go over a little bit of FlexPod and VDI in general, um, and and for that we we welcome a host of some really good uh, and very authoritative presenters here today uh, from both Cisco and NetApp. Um, again, for I've got literally 30 or 40 new people joined since I started a minute ago. Uh, there is a Q&A panel on the right hand side, so please uh, feel free to use that Q&A panel. Um, to ask uh, questions as they come up, and we will be monitoring that and, and hopefully being able to answer all your questions. Uh, so uh, with that said, uh, again, everyone, thank you. Um, hard time out there. I certainly uh, hope for everyone is, uh, is safe and healthy, um, and, and I hope this is a relevant topic for all of you. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and have our first presenter, Shanti from, uh, from Cisco, uh, let me give him the presenter privileges. Uh, start us off on on our webinar. Shanti, um, you're muted. I'll unmute you. All right. But hey. but it's all yours. Yep. Hey guys. Um, good morning, everyone. So thanks for inviting us to present um, the the t the very topic that um, that is uh, very important for all of us during this um, troubled times. And so today, um, I would we'll be walking over some of these market drivers for this remote work, and um, and then also talk about the flexpod momentum, and um, kind of briefly introduce you to the VDI concepts and benefits, um, and then talk about why flexpod for VDI, and um, you know, we have recently released a CVD um, that's great work uh, that we have done together with um, NetApp and Cisco together. So we'll be talking about the, how the solution was put together and, um, and talk about the validation and the results that were obtained. And, um, and most importantly, we have been like, you know, um, working on some quick ship bundles uh, to you know, address the current situation. So I think uh, you'll be um, 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 very pleased to hear those uh, bundles um, um, and then take advantage of those. And then lastly, we'll go over the, some of the customer case studies and uh, just give you some pointers on where things are. Having said that, let's get uh, started. So as you can see, like, you know, I think companies have been like, you know, uh, going through the digital transformation journey and uh, for decades, uh, you know, technology advancements have changed the way we work. And, um, um, and in today's fast paced digital world, Work transformation, the future of work is a major disruptive force, and organizations are having a hard time keeping up. So currently, we see a lot of challenges with this whole uh, the way where we are working. I mean, um, sometimes the you know uh, people complain about like inflexible work environments, and there's like you know uh, talent issues. There's like a rigid organization and hierarchical leadership. And, and mostly, like, you know, I think a lot of uh, times uh, it's, like, it's more, more about security, your privacy policies, and the trust. So, um, and then on top of that, like, you know, we are going through this pandemic, and now what co corporations are uh, forced to, like, you know, um, adopt to the remote-first work culture, and um, as more and more employees are working from home or working remotely. All right? So, um, Suddenly, like, you know, um, previously only like 20% of the workforce are like, you know, are working remotely or working, um, um, you know, from a, a location other than the office space. Um, I mean, you, I mean, traditionally you had a, a desktop centric worker or a corridor worker, like, you know, or a remote worker or like, you know, the people or a worker who is on the go, always on the go. And then there's like a, the serious worker, like, you know, doing high intensive work. Um, so there's different type of workers. But now with this pandemic and, you know, this current situation we are in, everyone is, is a remote worker now. And then organizations have to keep up with that and then try, I mean, and try to adapt and, and make sure the infrastructure scales and, and, and can, like, you know, um, support it. So... FlexPod has been there uh, since like the last um, um, uh, ten like ten years of collaboration between NetApp and Cisco, 
and um, we can certainly address this challenge with um, with FlexPod. And um, you know, we have jointly innovated solutions um, across like you know different workloads. Uh, enterprise workloads and AI, deep learning, and and VDI, and um, um, and then we have been rated as number one on IT Central Station, and we have um, earned the CRN Product of the Year, and um, and then it's a, it's FlexPod in general is a platform for innovation, and it's trusted worldwide. I mean, together we have done thirty and a half billion dollars of um, business, and we have. Uh, have 9,500 customers worldwide uh, with 1,100 partners supporting FlexPod. And we have spent countless hours of, um, um, you know, solution validation, like creating the, all these CVDs. This is co-validated designs. And, um, and then we have sold about 6,000 plus uh, petabytes of um, so storage and all. So we have been working very hard um, for the last 10 plus years. And, um, and then to make FlexPod the most cloud-connected CI platform. Having said that, I will pass it on to my colleague, um, Suresh, if you want to grab the ball and then go through some of these VDI concepts and walk through the solution. Thanks, Shanti. So let's look at the various components of a traditional desktop. It consists of an operating system and certain applications that require for performing the job, and you have user preferences and their data. By separating them into separate layers, we can mix and match, and we can manage it on various layers. One thing common between uh, many uh, user profile management Okay, that is taking care of the user preferences and data is a common need of SMB file shares. Now, does all the users need all the components, like all the layers? Probably not. Like if you look into the user type, we can categorize them into three broad categories. The first one is the task worker. The task worker predominantly works on single applications throughout the day. For example, the nurses in a hospital. Okay, then we have a knowledge worker who opens multiple applications throughout the day. And for example, they'll be working on Microsoft Office, browsing through the web, and they'll be doing a bunch of applications throughout the day. Then the third type we have is the power user who requires high-end graphic workstations like uh, the users predominantly work on like a cat cam kind of application or like a video editing uh, user, they are all fall under the power users category. Now, for those users, if you look at it, for the task workers, the published application uh, represents a key benefit. For Knowledge workers, either in a shared session or virtual desktop works better. And for power users, the virtual desktop is preferred. The virtual desktops are all, it's a single session. So it will be like a, a desktop operating system, like Windows 10. And RTS server sessions are all, it's a multi-session. For example, like a terminal service, like similar to that one. And for the published app, it's to provide an end user an app-like experience, like mobile app kind of experience for the end user. It is an hosted application um, which can be running on RDSH server or it can be from a stream public stream app. Okay. Now, just to get a feel of it, okay, this is an uh, sample. Uh, right on client view. Here you can see on the top, like you can see the desktop pool, and below, like you have the posted app. So in the posted app, they will just see the icon. If they click on it, it launches the application. Now, when you have a pool of desktops, 
when a user logs in, uh, you have like two different categories. One is you have a uh, floating desktop or a dedicated desktop. In a floating desktop, whenever a user logs in, they will get an, a random uh, desktop from the pool. There is no guarantee that they will get the same desktop. So yeah, this scenario will be helpful where you have one to many uh, relationship, like uh, you have one desktop where you can be shared by multiple users. Typically, like a shift worker, or it can be in the kiosk. Then you have uh, the dedicated one. In the dedicated one, whenever a user logs in, they will always get the same desktop. So this is preferred uh, uh, for uh, the customers where they need to have some uh, the their own applications. Like if they need to install it, if they have a specific application, um, then that's the need for dedicated desktops. But the uh, new trend is uh, it's moving towards going towards everybody gets the floating desktop, and then any need for uh, special applications, those are all handled by the application delivery uh, and the higher layer. Mm. Now, if you look at the uh, typical VMware Horizon environment, the users, they will be able to access uh, the virtual environment from any devices, and it can be an, a physical machine or the virtual machines uh, created from any other hypervisor. So those are all it's managed through a manual pool. Okay, that one is uh, like one only thing is only requirement is like you need to have the agent installed on the target devices. Once the agent is installed, that can be brokered. Okay, through the VMware Horizon, and the client will be able to access it. Now, uh, there is an uh, another uh, method of the automated desktop provisioning, where the uh, broker takes care of provisioning in the machine, as well as uh, presenting to the end users. Now, in uh, automated desktop provisioning, you have three categories. Okay, in the full clone, each desktop will be a complete copy of the parent image. So that will be uh, taking more storage space. To avoid that one, and the link clone, okay, that will provide some storage saving, having a uh, sharing and uh, parent disk, and each desktop will have its own uh, delta disk. So any changes that's made by the desktop, it will go into the desktop. In a link clone, um, typically, like uh, there are many reboots are being done, okay, to provision and a desktop. Okay, so always uh, in the traditional like we had issues with the uh, bootstraps. So now to avoid that one, the instant clone, the instant clone, it not only uh, provides a storage saving on a disk, but it will also does it for the, your memory. So since it's it's using the uh, PSPS 6 feature, known as like a VM forking. Um, using that feature, like it will be able to clone instantaneously by sharing the storage disk as well as the memory. So it will be able to create more, any number of clones in a matter of seconds. With the FlexPod, we have a validated solutions that's available for both Citrix virtual apps and desktop, as well as for VMware Horizon. So those links for those documents are all available uh, in the slide. And you can also search on Google, you'll find it. Now, there are certain use cases where uh, the customers require multiple monitors with high resolution, like 4K, uh, 5K resolutions if they require that. And also, uh, like nowadays, the users are all start using more collaborative tools and video conferencing within a virtual desktop that demands high you know, CPU. So to offshore those, the GPUs 
uh, will help. And with NVIDIA, we will be able to provide a virtual instance of a GPU and present it to the uh, virtual desktops. So uh, the desktops will be able to use those and cater to those use cases. Now let's look at a white export for VDI. And with a with a with a flexpot convert solution, the use is uh, provides a straightforward, resilient, balanced system that is easy to deploy, manage, and scale. Our validated design provides reduce the risk associated with implementation and increase system performance. Now, here are the uh, key contact features that is used for uh, the VDI. We will see in much more detail in the subsequent slide. The ONTAP provides file services that is required for the VDI. Okay, that's for user data and uh, uh, user profile. ONTAP provides a full spectrum like setting up a quota so you can limit the storage space for the end user or you can allow a single volume or a single namespace like for example a file share that can grow in uh, thousands of petabytes if you are only restricted by the hardware amount. The flex group volume uh, enables that one. Uh, the members of a flex group volume are spread across all the storage nodes on the uh, contact cluster, and the storage nodes can be expanded up to 24 nodes. By expanding the, uh, the member volumes on all the nodes, it will be able to utilize all the resources available okay, on those storage nodes. That includes the networking, uh, the processing power, so all those resources, okay, it will be able to utilize. So what uh, the benefit the customers get is, okay, as they are scaling, they are not impacted by any performance because the performance, uh, as you scale the capacity, the performance is also scaled along with it. On the on tap, the, the storage virtual machine has been a key feature, and uh, the SPM provides a virtual storage array okay, for the customers, and it enables us to provide a multi tenancy that can have an overlapping IP addresses. So, in a VDA environment, like you can have an test environment and a production environment okay, from the same storage array, or even uh, companies, when they are merging or consolidating, they will be able to host all of them on the same array. And it provides, uh, in, like each SVM has its own logical uh, data interfaces. So any management of those, like if you are bringing those down, it will not affect the other SVM. Uh, same thing, any volumes residing on the SVM, the other ASPM will not be able to access it without the admin uh, policies. Now, while you're consolidating it, okay, one of the key thing is uh, what happens uh, to the performance, right? Like uh, with on tap, you have the adaptive queue feature where you can set both the upper throughput limit as well as the lower throughput limit based on allocated size or use space. So now in a desktop environment, as you are expanding the number of users, the performance is also guaranteed along with it. And uh, apart from upper and lower limit, you can also set an minimum uh, IOPS because uh, if you are setting it for an use space, and initially, if the use space is zero, so uh, to, uh, 
avoid like very low uh, performance limit. Instead of that one, we are setting a little bit higher, like uh, for a reasonable IOPS that is required for that application. Contact also provides a flexible management solution. For um, VMware uh, environment, the VSC uh, Virtual Storage Console is a vCenter plugin that provides an optimized uh, host settings that one will be automatically applied. And also, it provides an uh, AI support for NFS data store. And it also enables the VASA provider we provide. For automation, we have a uh, PowerShell module, uh, which uh, any administrator, because uh, most of uh, VDA environment, it, the PowerShell tool is the preferred one. So we have an uh, ONTAP module okay, uh, for the PowerShell. Uh, but if you want to do with Ansible, we also have Ansible playbooks available. For managing um, the storage cluster, you can use the ONTAP system manager, and the, if you have multiple of them, then you can utilize ActiveIQ Unified Manager, and ActiveIQ Unified Manager also will enable, will suggest you uh, to set the appropriate uh, policies, like uh, in QS, like it will suggest you to the value. So it will be, um, easier to manage. And last but not the least, the ONTAP provides a built in class and storage efficiency features like a thin provisioning, DDoP, compression, and compact thin, okay, which produces a cost saving. Now for the solution validation, I will hand over to Vadim. Hello everyone, uh, hope everyone is well. Um, my name is Vadim Lebedev, I'm Cisco Technical Marketing Engineer working on large scale B, uh, BDI uh, conversion infrastructure. Um, as well as performance uh, uh, and graphic testing of PDI solutions on uh, UCS. Uh, thank you, Suresh. Uh, there was a great overview of various technologies uh, that go into VDI FlexPod. Now, let me give you some specifics to the latest design. So what has changed uh, in this particular design compared to the latest one that we have put in it is a lot. This time we have updates to hardware, software, as well as some procedural changes that's worth of note. Uh, the fourth generation fabric interconnects uh, that enables high performance and low latency um, and lossless fabric architecture was introduced in this design. So this fabric interconnects allows you to deploy 10, 25, 40, and 100 gigabit Ethernet and FCOE, as well as support for 32 gigabit fiber channel. This provides UCS customers with high bandwidth and more configuration options. So they can have higher performance ports and the flexibility to support LAN and SAN connectivity for all service within a domain. This time around, we're also using the second generation Xeon scalable processors that now come with the higher core counts delivering high performance and scalability for compute intensive workloads across compute storage and network. They provide now up to 50% greater memory bandwidth and capacity, and including uh, support for the Intel Optane persistent memory supporting up to 36 terabytes um, of system level memory capacity. Uh, that's in combination uh, with the traditional DRAM as well as introduce some improvements in security and a multitude of other enhancements that, that complement this new processor. This time around, we're using ONTAP System Manager 9.6. That's now offering a simple initial setup and upgrade with some key security enhancements. Uh, 
also providing uh, a new experience for ONTAP system manager design to be optimized GUI for IT generalists. In this release, uh, at the moment, this is a, a read-only preview. And uh, in addition uh, uh, to that, uh, support now for NVMe 512 kilobyte block, uh, snap mirror synchronous support uh, for relationship on SIPs, NFS version 4, and quota enabled volumes. Um, flex group volumes now enabling edit, shrink in size, and volume granular encryptions, and many more. In addition to this, uh, to hardware software updates, we now have uh, a large increase in scope of the testing. We now test at full scale with individual workloads, such as RDSH, persistent and non-persistent VDI workloads, and that's in addition to the mixed, where the combination of this is used to showcase su support of the converged infrastructure of various deployment strategies. Here is a, a, an architecture diagram of the FlexPod. It, it is a typical pod configuration. It provides outstanding ease of deployment, system performance, and resiliency. A single connect and end-to-end -end IO architecture that incorporates Cisco virtual interface cards, uh, Cisco UCS fabric interconnects, and Cisco fabric extender technology to connect every server on a single network fabric and on a single network layer. The fiber channel multipathing and the Cisco VPC are used for connectivity of the UCS and upstream services. Uh, Cisco Gen 4 FIs used in this validated design now have uh, 25 gigabit Ethernet connectivity support and a Cisco MDS 9100 switches support a 32 gigabit fiber channel. This show shows uh, key hardware elements for the FlexPod solution. They can be separated into three categories, network, compute, and storage. Cisco Nexus 9300 series switches provide connectivity to users over LAN networks and the Cisco UCS domains. Cisco ECS 6400 series fabric interconnects give unified access to storage and LAN networks. Uh, B-series blades uh, provide compute for virtual machines. Uh, for the storage, uh, we use NetApp All Flash A300 with a single disk that provides the storage for the virtual machines and MDS 9100 series 32 gigabit fiber channel SAN switches provide fiber channel connectivity between an NetApp storage and the UCS domain. The Converge Infrastructure VDI solution takes standard 42U rack in a data center, and all hardware components in this solution are configured in the M plus one resiliency fashion that ensures system availability in the, in the event of the component failure. As I mentioned before, the second generation Intel scalable processor provide higher core counts of higher performing cores. They rely on Intel virtualization technology that features mode-based execution virtualization that provides an extra layer of um, protection from malware attacks in virtualized environments. Uh, there's, um, they use TSC virtualization that provides the workload uh, Optimization allowing virtual machines to move across CPU operating at different base frequencies, as well as a, a Intel NM 4.0, and that helps to optimize the power cooling um, for the compute resources in the data in the data center, maximizing the efficiency. We used uh, 6230 second gen processor, which provides the right balance of performance and the cost. For this uh, scale of the project, and it was given us an 80 uh, logical processors and 2.1 gigahertz. So 
So now it's worth talking about uh, NVIDIA vGPU technology with the big proliferation of Windows 10 and a graphic intensive application now. Um, so what is NVIDIA vGPU? It enables multiple virtual machines uh, to have simultaneous access uh, to a single physical GPU um, and use of the same NVIDIA graphics drivers that are deployed on a non-virtualized operating system. Now, uh, each vGPU is similar uh, to a conventional GPU, having a fixed amount of GPU frame buffer and uh, one or more uh, virtual display outputs. The GPU frame buffer is allocated uh, out of the physical GPU uh, frame buffer at the same time that the vGPU is created. And the vGPU retains um, exclusive use of that frame buffer until it's destroyed. And that happens at the uh, machine boot and the shutdown. Now, there are different types of uh, uh, virtual GPUs that the physical GPU supports. In the VDI environments, normally uh, used uh, Q, B, and A. Uh, and those are designed for the virtual works workstation. Um, uh, for the virtual workstation, uh, for technical professionals who create performance, uh, who need performance, um, B is normally used for the general uh, VDI uh, or knowledge type workers, and A is uh, for the application, uh, for the application users. Uh, the vGPU type and the amount of frame buffer uh, that is uh, allocated to the VM is managed via profiles that are configured on the virtual machines. Uh, so by, by doing this, the NVIDIA vGPU provides virtual desktop VMs with unparalleled graphic performance across multiple workloads. Cisco B200 M5 that is used in this project uh, supports up to two NVIDIA P6 cards, and the ideal for the VDI applications as well as consolidating and replacing engineering workstations and PC user types like designers or 3D modelers. It has a single GPU with a 2048 CUDA cores and a 16 gigs of GDR5 memory. 32 concurrent VDI users per blade with one gig Frame buffer profile uh, is the max count for this uh, uh, for this blade. Uh, those users are able to support up to two HD monitors. I'd like to also mention that uh, NVIDIA cards have full UCS manager integration. And it's spanning firmware, vBIOS, service profiles, and there's nobody else that can give that functionality except Cisco. The Flexpot, uh, Flexpot, Flexpot CVD design include uh, a how-to guidance on installing and configuring the cards um, in the GPU architect. So let's talk a little bit about what software that went into uh, um, this design and uh, latest UCSM 404E was used to provide support for the Cisco UCS 24-way fabric extenders with eight 25 gigabit Ethernet FCOE capable ports. Uh, we also uh, used the uh, uh, NetApp Virtual Storage Console for the VMware vSphere hypervisor free plugin. Um, it has a deep integrations with vSphere, uh, providing easy button automation for key storage uh, directly from the vCenter. We used uh, um, ESX, ESXi 6.7 update 2 that has um, updates to the scheduler to manage impact from the mitigation of the CPU vulnerabilities, um, such as Meltdown and Spectre. Horizon 7.10 that has been tagged as a standard service branch release and now supports REST APIs. Um, VMware's continued improvements to the functionality of the HTML based Horizon console. Um, went into this version also. 
Uh, we use the Windows Server 2019, and that uh, uh, has uh, quite a bit of improvements to the RDS um, that improve um, connection between the premises and the public and cloud infrastructures. Uh, there's some additional protection against the cyber threats and uh, a big improvements in uh, GPU virtualization. To add to that, we also use the Windows 10. This time around, we use 1809, which was a latest uh, uh, add-on to LTSC branch. Logan BSI is uh, 4125 was used for testing. I think it shows an example of a distributed component configuration used in this validated design. Uh, a simplified version of this configuration is often deployed for um, an initial proof of concept deployment. Um, so distributing components of your deployment among the greater number of servers provides the greatest scalability and fallover in your site. We configured all Active Directory common and VM Horizon services to support our design scale and resilience and resiliency requirement, they all were hosted on a two B200M5 blades that were configured uh, in the infrastructure cluster. Three other clusters uh, of 10 B200M5s were designed and configured to support the validated design's workload requirement. Architecture of the environment and uh, component installation and configuration is covered in the CVD document in the detail. So this slide illustrates the configuration of the VDI and RDS uh, VMs that we used uh, to run the uh, user workload. Uh, what's worth of note here, uh, the configuration for the uh, vCPU and RAM. Uh, this were specific to uh, the knowledge worker requirements uh, for the workloads that we have run. Amount of RAM can be adjusted to your particular needs. Uh, for this CVD, uh, we used uh, 3 gigs for the Windows 10 and uh, 24 gigs uh, for, our, uh, for our RDSH servers. Recommended load uh, is derived via testing process, and the current recommended load per blade for the knowledge worker users were 180 BDI sessions and 224 RDS sessions. For the project, we use the mid-range NetApp um, all-flash A300 uh, with two storage controllers configured in active-active high availability pair running on TAP 9.6 P4 uh, on that version. And that came with a single um, uh, DS224 disk shelf containing 24 3.8 terabyte SSD disks um, with 65 terabyte usable. Uh, so the A300, um, that supported uh, FC boot with multipathing for the pod, as well as the NFS and SIF storage necessary for common services in the VDI workload use. The storage volumes were configured uh, in, in this uh, fashion. We had 32 boot lungs for 32 blades. Um, safe share for the user profiles and uh, eight NFS volumes for ESXi data stores. Eight volumes we used to evenly distribute the load uh, across the node uh, processor cores. So let me uh, talk a little bit about the testing process and give you some of the results for the testing. This slide uh, illustrates all the test cases we used to validate this solution. 
Those best cases include single server, cluster, and the full scale tests. All tests performs with using a login VSI testing framework, a standard in testing VDI environments. Each test approximately takes two hours and includes uh, the bootstorm, idling, and uh, user logins with the workload execution in the benchmarking mode. We execute tests three times in a back-to-back -back fashion to verify cons consistency of the design performance. So what is the workload we use? Uh, again, we use the login VSI with a knowledge worker workload in the benchmarking mode. The knowledge worker workload is designed for the two vCPU environments. It's a well-balanced, intensive workload that stresses the system, resulting in a higher CPU, RAM, and I.O. usage. Uh, it uses a few applications at a time, all of, all, all of the office, office applications, as well as uh, Adobe Reader, uh, Java applications, um, Photo Viewer, uh, in addition to some of the native Windows apps, such as Notepad and uh, WinZip, to complete print and zip functions. So what are the results? And here, it's worth talking about um, how we read this result and how we determine the system performance and how the login VSI gauges the system performance. And the login VSI gauges the system performance based on the application uh, responsiveness. And the way they derive this is with the two values, base, and average. The base is the best performance of the system during the test, the lowest responsive times for the, for the applications. This number is used to determine what the performance threshold will be um, so the side base gives an indication of the base performance of the environment. When the environment is uh, um, uh, unstressed, and of course, the lower number is better. The side threshold is a number that indicates the system fully, completely utilized. And then normally, this is just a second uh, added to the baseline. And then there's a VSI average that's indicative of the application responsiveness as the test progresses. Uh, it indicates average value calculated by login VSI. It differs from the true average. Um, it, it has, uh, it applies a certain statistical rules basically to avoid any spikes um, from inf influencing the calculation. And so what we see here is a full scale test graph from the login VSI analyzer depicting the system performance uh, of running 6,700 RDSH users um, running on 30 blades. And as you see, we have a baseline of 706 milliseconds with the average at the end of the test when all 607 users run in the workload uh, of uh, 1529 milliseconds, well below the threshold of 1706. So let's look at some additional results for the different workloads. This is a, a login VSI analyzer graph from the full scale test of 5400 persistent users running Windows 10. And again, we have a baseline of 837 milliseconds with an average uh, at the end when all 5,400 users are running the workloads on a system of uh, 1502. Once again, well below the average. And now I'm going to 
pass the ball back to Suresh to talk a little bit more specifically on the storage performance. Thanks, Odin. So uh, what you're uh, uh, reading from the graphers, okay, so during the testing, we did an uh, power on, the initial uh, power on of all the desktops and waited for it to register on the broker. And then we gradually uh, added the users to uh, log in into the desktop. Then we had a uh, steady state. After that, uh, the users are all logging off. So the complete cycle is captured. Uh, so for a sample, we added a couple of graphs uh, on the slide deck. Okay, so this one is uh, the full scale uh, for the total IAP. So that one includes um, the NFS data store where the, the desktops are all hosting, as well as uh, the SMB. And another point to note uh, here is uh, we used a roaming user profile, uh, which generates a lot of IO compared to other user profile management solutions. So we took the worst case scenario and uh, tested with it. Okay, so the next slide. Okay, so for a similar uh, scenarios, okay, so this one is uh, showing the IOPS uh, that's consumed uh, on the storage side and the latency it produced. Okay, during a boot up, gradually adding the user's login, okay, then at the end, uh, the log off. For additional graphs, please refer the CVD. So now I give it back to Shanti. Uh, Kathan, sorry. So uh, hi everyone. So this is uh, Kathan Mota. Uh, I'm a product manager uh, at NetApp. So we'll quickly cover the uh, some what what have we done from a enablement perspective, and also uh, you know uh, we'll uh, talk about two case studies that we have. So from a, a sales enablement perspective, uh, we have uh, two items here that we want to uh, cover. Uh, you know, given the current uh, situation and the increased uh, demand uh, for this solution, uh, what we have built out is a, a quick ship program uh, that uh, are essentially uh, a way to uh, an accelerate the uh, ordering process and the fulfillment process uh, for the for the overall solution. So uh, Cisco has uh, built out a set of solution IDs. Uh, that are available. These are all static configurations, and you can view them as a building block uh, to, uh, you know, towards your greenfield implementation or for uh, an expansion of an additional of, of expansion of a current VDI environment. Uh, they were really sized for uh, more of the knowledge worker uh, users, and um, you know they are available. They're currently live uh, on Cisco Commerce uh, workspace. And, and we also have created a VDI assets, uh, you know, uh, uh, a section on, on the Cisco NetApp portal where more information on this program will be available. But the whole idea here is that you can take advantage of these bundles and that enables you to quickly, uh, you don't really have to size anything. You don't, these are all the pre-configured. You cannot really change anything, but this expedites the overall process uh, and the lead time is much shorter if you really go with uh, these bundles. Um, and leveraging those bundles, we have created some uh, starting point, uh, uh, you know, a t-shirt sizing for the solution. And, you know, these are, uh, as I mentioned, you know, these are starting point references. You know, they could be helpful for your initial sizing estimation. Uh, there are certain assumptions that have been gone into uh, the sizing, uh, you can use them uh, for you know expediting your sizing process. Uh, but we can we recommend that you consult with uh, Flexport Architects from NetApp and Cisco uh, for detailed uh, sizing guidance. So these T-shirt sizes are available in really four uh, configurations. Uh, you know to give you a perspective on you know what would you take for you know a specific uh, size of uh, different VDI environments. So let's uh, let's quickly look at uh, two customer case studies here. So both of these case studies are available for a reference. There is a link out here for more information. Uh, Canon Design is a is a great customer uh, case study that focuses on uh, on this customer that has 
you know, 15 different global sites. Now, this is a engineering architectural design firm. Uh, they are really, uh, they were listed as, you know, one of the top 10 uh, design firms uh, globally. So, you know, uh, they, they have a, a user profile uh, where they have architects, engineers, you know, builders, industry experts, all of these folks need to collaborate. And what their unique challenge was that they wanted to provide a, a single experience to all of these users, no matter where these users are on a global basis. Uh, they initially had a, a MSP that uh, was providing their IT services, and you know uh, the services uh, were not very reliable. They missed SLAs, so they decided to bring it back. And essentially, you know, you see a lot of the uh, benefits highlighted. I won't go into all of those details, but you know, one of the unique aspects of FlexPod, you know, once they bought FlexPod in, they were able to reduce the overall uh, with the consolidation. They really uh, reduced it from down from 45 racks to 13 racks. So as you can see, they they got tremendous amount of gains, you know, performance gains. Uh, they reduced the footprint, and uh, you know they got several other benefits that are mentioned here. So this is one excellent customer case study available. Uh, and one other point I wanted to note is, you know, from the earlier you know categorization of users that we mentioned, you know, a lot of the users for Canon Design really fit into that you know power user category which really they require high end design high end graphics and you know they were able to also replace their you know need for dedicated workstations and you know replace that with this you know uh, VDI environment that could really support this high end graphics use cases so the other case study is uh, on LCMC health uh, this is a uh, you know, after uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina really, uh, uh, you know, uh, devastated uh, the area, you know, uh, 10 years after that, they, they decided to open a brand new uh, university medical center. And, you know, as part of that, they wanted to, uh, you know, open up a brand new data center. And everything was under a tight uh, deployment schedule. So, you know, the key challenge here was that they wanted to get everything up and running in in three months uh, time frame, which is extremely tight schedule. Uh, they had, along with VDI, they had a need for Epic electronic health record application, uh, as well as other 200 other applications. So, and they wanted to make sure that you know their 3,000 plus users had access to this patient information, their electronic health record app, from anywhere and from any time. And Flexpod was able to deliver uh, not only that on the not only on the tight deadlines, but really you know it it was able to meet the consistent uh, you know performance requirements that they had, and in fact it also increased uh, their application performance overall by two to four times. So, so this is a fantastic case study uh, that you can leverage uh, focused on the healthcare industry and how VDI uh, helped them. And lastly, you know, we have a bunch of resources here. Uh, we will have one more, uh, you know, asset that is currently being developed uh, probably within the next week or so. We should have that live uh, that will talk about the you know, five reasons why FlexPod is best for VDI. So we'll have that asset made available. Uh, I encourage you to look at this uh, VDI asset collection page. This is a partner portal, uh, ciscoandadapt.com slash VDI. This is where you will see several one pagers uh, that have been put together. Uh, we will also include all the additional assets that we are uh, building out. Uh, so, you know, uh, please refer to that location. And I've listed out some of the technical assets that are already currently available. Uh, this is the current CVD that was brand new that's been published. We also have a past CVD uh, on Citrix Zen Desktop, and we did two white papers that highlighted the, the high graphics uh, use cases with VDI. So with that, um, that's all from my side. All right, and I think that does it for for us. And I see that all the uh, questions were answered in the in the Q and A. Uh, everyone, thank you uh, again. Um, I know it's uh, just one of those times, and I really do appreciate you taking your time uh, to be with us. So uh, we will send a copy of the presentation as well as link it to the recording, uh, as well as a link to the CVD that we've been referencing here this whole time. 
um, probably within the next day or two as, as, uh, as those become available. So uh, with that, thank you so much. Be on the lookout for next month's uh, Winning Together, which we'll be uh, covering uh, some SIP topics. So anyway, uh, if you have any other further questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll make sure to engage our experts. Again, thank you so much. Have a great day and thank you again to our speakers and our, and our panelists. Take care.